Um, <clears throat> in my role with the Platte River Recovery Program, I focus primarily on physical process relationships um, in the river as they relate to endangered species issues. Um, so I spend a lot of time looking at hydrology, hydraulics, geomorphology, and then how endangered species either respond or don't respond to the things that we're doing. Um, I guess after, after doing that for seven or eight years, my most important point would probably be that as groundwater, surface water interactions change stream flow, these are linked systems, and the characteristics and function of these streams and the biotic communities will adjust to those changes, sometimes in novel or unexpected ways. Um, for folks who think about resilience theory, you know, basically you can have multiple stable states, different things can happen. Um, not necessarily a bad thing, but when you have things like endangered species in your basin, um, that can lead to regulatory intervention and the need to back that up and try to restore or change the system back to a previous state. Um, Central Platte River is an extreme example. You know, we've looked at channel width change of, in some cases, four or 5,000 feet almost over the last 50 or 60 years. So it's a much different river than it used to be. Um, the other kind of interesting challenge is that when you think about rivers and ecological function or ecological services, water for birds, things like that, rivers take a lot of water. Um, they need a lot of water for those ecosystem services. So. For example, the primary flow management <coughs> action for the Platte River Recovery Program to maintain species habitat is short duration high flow. Basically 75 to 100,000 acre feet of water over three or four days down the river. That's a lot of water. Um, you think about how much water costs, it, it's very expensive. So we're talking tens of millions of dollars on an annual or near annual basis to maintain species habitat. Um, and I think we're finding probably that that may not even be enough. You may actually need more water than that if you want to do this all through natural flow. So um, you know, big challenges there. On the other hand, we're also tasked with looking at novel or different ways to maintain habitat. So we're trying mechanical interventions to create the same kind of disturbance that you get from these large peak flows that mobilize sediment and remove vegetation and things like that. And we're finding we can do the same types of things mechanically at maybe two orders of magnitude less in cost. Um, so that starts to bring up interesting questions, and we have a couple GC members on the panel here um, as far as sustainability. And, and several <coughs> folks today have already brought up the concept of what is sustainability. Um, you know, we, we're going to have <coughs> our governing body is going to have to make some decisions about what, what do they think sustainability is. Is it hydrologic sustainability? Is it economic from a cost perspective? It costs a lot of money to do these things. These, the states and federal government put a lot of money into this program. Is it ecosystem function? Is it returning the river to a state where the physical processes work the way they used to be? Those are very different things. Um, and I can almost guarantee that the range of stakeholders that make decisions for the program will have very different ideas about what sustainability should be or what it means to them depending on their their orientation or their values. So um, I guess I would say that from a program perspective we are working hard to figure out how to use water in the most efficient way to meet our management objectives um, and probably over the next three or four years, there's gonna be a lot of candid discussion about what is sustainable into a second increment of the program. What does that mean? And I think that is going to be instrumental in informing what we do as far as groundwater, surface water management and acquisitions into the future. Thank you. Great. Well, thanks for having me here. Uh, again, my name is Jim Schneider. I'm the deputy director at DNR. I've, I've also got another job these last few months. I've been the acting director as well. so. So if I look tired, that, that is your explanation. Um, <laughs> yeah. So um, one of the things that we've worked on um, at DNR over the recent years is developed a lot of data. Um, you know, one of the, the things about DNR is we don't make a lot of the decisions regarding um, how we should manage water in Nebraska, um, but we can, you know, what, what we see we have a really strong role though in influencing those decisions by providing great information. 
um, and, and great assistance. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about uh, that today and talk about some of the, the challenges and opportunities we have going into the future. So I'm sure you've, you've heard a lot about this today. We've got abundant but, but, but limited renewable water resources in Nebraska. Uh, we've got this massive High Plains Aquifer, about, about 2 billion acre feet. That's a lot of water. Um, and that, that's really uh, beneficial to us pr pr providing a, a substantial buffer to get us through dry periods um, when our streams don't flow very well. Um, but I look at, in terms of talking about what our supply of water is, the way we look at it is that this, what, what would be in the stream absent the activities of man is our, is our supply because that's, that's what's actually renewable. That's what Mother Nature is going to provide us year in and year out on average. Um, so uh, to, to figure out what this supply is, you have to measure the streams, but you also have to measure the uses, um, the, the, the uh, diversions of surface water and the consumptive use from that as well as the impact of groundwater pumping on the stream and by and large there's a there's a few areas of the state where where groundwater pumping primarily affects the aquifer um, that's about uh, about three counties in southwest Nebraska and one county in the panhandle um, but by and large the rest of the water use whether it's groundwater or surface water use is affecting stream flow not the aquifer um, so and and that's that's great um, you know that, that's that renewable water supply that I was talking about um, so just to go through a bit about what our water supplies are in the various river basins in the state, starting with the Republican River Basin, the, the share of the water in the Republican River Basin that we get as, as a state is, is dictated by the compact that we have with Kansas and Colorado. Generally speaking, the water supply, um, the stream flow supply in that basin ranges from about 500 to 700,000 acre feet per year, um, and we get about half of that. Um, and you can see from this bar up here, um, there's dry years, uh, this bar graph, there's dry years where, uh, let's see, these years right here where we actually used all of our water. Actually, the, um, we used more than all of our water and that turned out to be kind of a problem, but um, <laughs> technically speaking, we used all of our water. We'll just leave it at that. Um, and there's also other years though where we don't use all our water and it slips through our fingers and, and flows down to Kansas and they might not even <coughs> use it either. Um, and so this is an op this represents an op uh, obviously these dry years represent challenges in, in managing um, and, and keeping our uses within within our supply. But these wet years represent opportunities in terms of retiming these water supplies for for future use. And uh, the, if you look at all those bars and add them up, that was approximately four hundred thousand acre feet since two thousand that 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 we didn't use. Switching to the Upper Platte River um, water supplies, we, we, we generally get about a million acre feet of water in from Wyoming, um, and we have a court decree that guarantees that, thankfully. Um, and the, the inflows from the, the South Platte are a lot more variable, um, though, and so uh, this year they've been good, but in some years they're, they're, uh, there's virtually no inflow from the South Platte. Um, generally speaking, the water is fully allocated in, in this part of the state. Um, but, and, and especially in the part of this basin that's designated as over-appropriated. But this, this graph here is showing the results of a study that uh, HDR did for us. Um, and these, in these years, there was actual unappropriated water that, that didn't get used by some user. Um, and there's a link here for, uh, to access this report. But again, um, the, the challenges in this basin are that there's, there's, there's uh, competing uses and Usually we, we use pretty much all the water, but there's, again, opportunities with, with these wet years where we can try to, try to grab some of that water and, and retime it. So now I'm going to lump together the rest of the river basins that we have information for, and really this only leaves out some of the Missouri tributaries, and, and we're currently developing information for those areas. We just don't have groundwater models yet to be able to <coughs> assess the, the groundwater effect on the stream flow in those areas. Um, I think that project's going to be done within a year. Um, so this is lumping all of these river basins together um, into, um, into one uh, pie, so to speak. And um, that's shown right here. So in all of those other river basins, the average annual supply is a little over 7 million acre feet per year. Um, and you can see right now the way that that supply um, exists is that 6% is consumed by surface water users, 
12% is consumed by groundwater wells. There is um, about half of it is used in the stream and about a third of it is remaining for use. So that sounds pretty good. It sounds like we've got, got things in pretty good shape. Um, but that's only near term. Um, you really have to look long term and consider the effects of the rest of the groundwater use. We just heard earlier that groundwater is the majority of, of the use. So um, in fact, um, when, you, when you factor in all of the hydrologically connected groundwater use, it's more like 30% of, of the supply that's going to groundwater wells with 6% going to surface water, about 48% being used in the stream. And there I'm talking about in-stream flows and hydropower uses primarily. And then about 16% uh, that we have um, available for use. And that's, that's an average value. So what does that look like um, from year to year? Uh, in the near term, there's always some extra water in the river um, with, with, the, with the uses that we have. And, and obviously I'll just caveat this that this doesn't mean there aren't local localized issues within this whole area, um, but this is just lumping everything together. Um, so down here, you can see the near term um, basically balance, and there's always excess water that isn't used right now in, 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 in that area. But when you go long term um, and add in that extra hydrologically connected water use, you can see those years when we're actually using more than we have. Um, that's still that still balances out on average right now, but you know, that's something that we're gonna have to keep a careful watch on and make sure that we don't, we don't go too far. So what do we see for the future of, of water planning? What we need to do to, to ensure that we um, are, are properly managing our water? We need to develop approaches to provide a framework for sustainability of core management goals. And those management goals are gonna be decided, decided locally. Um, we have quite a bit, quite, we have widely varying conditions across the state. Um, and so those decisions are going on now locally in, in the NRDs and the, the NRDs and the department are working on integrated management plans in almost every NRD um, to develop those goals. And one of the paramount um, parts of, of what those goals need to be and what's required by statute is to pr protect existing users of water and make sure if they're relying on water today that they'll have that water in the future. Uh, additionally, we need to expand implementation of alternate projects such as some of the conjunctive management projects that have already been developed in the Central Platte or the, the stream augmentation projects that have been developed for the Republican River Basin. We need to drive producer and water man manager level innovation. That's already been a huge part of how we manage water well and we have to continue that. Uh, we think we need to create flexible water markets where needed, where water is fully allocated. Um, there, there, there should probably be the ability for, for water to be traded in some, in some manner um, and uh, we're, we're hoping to, to work towards developing those markets as well with some of our partners um, and increase opportunities for public engagement and that's one of the really big things that we're working on in the department right now. We've done a lot of work with the, the University of Nebraska Public Policy Center trying to find out the current level of public engagement and the current level of kind of public knowledge about water and about the department and the NRDs and, and all of the, the, the state agencies that, that manage water so that we can hopefully um, devise strategies to enhance that public engagement and have a, a better communication, a, a better communications about what our water future needs to be um, uh, for, for Nebraskans. So thank you very much. Turn it to you. Well, if you're expecting that kind of uh, detail scientifically, we need to move on to the next person. <laughs> I am not going to provide that to you. Um, I am still convinced Mr. Ray is confused that I am another Scott Smathers, other than myself, that should be sitting here. Um, as was told to you, I was appointed to uh, LB 517, which is the Water Funding Task Force, which uh, resulted from <coughs> Senator Tom Carlson's hard work on that water sustainability. Um, LB 517 put 34 people in a room, 27 different stakeholders in six uh, of our legislative senators. Um, and we participated in 20 plus meetings over a six month period around the state. Um, rather intense, rather short term, high aggressive um, grazing, if you will, um, with all of us. And what was interesting about it is that uh, the end result is what you're all aware of of 1098 uh, and the subsequent funding that has arrived from 1098 um, and the new makeup of the new Natural Resource Commission. But what I'm really excited about, and, Dr. and, and Mr. Ray said, you know, ask what, tell what you're excited about is that 
Um, those first several meetings of the Water Funding Task Force, and some of those members are here, um, very distinct, unique stakeholders, um, some very distinct, unique uh, flag waving, if you will, um, and some new members, some new individuals at the table. I, I one, represent outdoor recreation users. Um, my good friend and uh, my twin brother from another mother, John Heaston, um, <laughs> He's the one who got the looks, by the way. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, he represented wildlife, and we had never been really at that table in that consistent basis prior to 517. <coughs> Excuse me. And what you saw and what I witnessed and what we all witnessed is that for 8 to 10 hours a day, there was a, a honeymoon period of all 27 of us. And at the end of the day, we'd sit down around the end of the table to break bread together and have a soft beverage. Um, and, and suddenly we all started to learn that one water is important for all of us how great your stake is, uh, how important your, your stakeholder value is, or how hard you're being driven by your stakeholder managers. We all need water, we need to find a way to one, continue the work from 962 that started uh, with a lot of great programs but lacked funding. Um, and so what developed was 27 people with distinct opinions and values. Um, and I can see Dennis Straw up there in the corner of my eye. Um, we, we didn't always agree on things, but at the end of the day and the end of the time, uh, we all understood one process that had to happen. We have to work together. And 517 worked into 1098, and Senator Carlson did a tremendous job along with some other senators to make sure that 1098 passed. And we received a substantial amount of initial funding. Um, we're currently working on some things to extend it out to 10 years. Uh, so we have substantial money to do water sustainability projects around the state. And I would tell you that when we moved from 517 to 1098, and when we the new 27 members were appointed either by the NRDs elected by the entities or appointed by the governor, uh, we retained 18 of the 27, actually 19 of the 27 water funding task force members on the new Natural Resource Commission. So we, we transferred tremendous synergy. We started to work together. Um, and individuals that are new to the Natural Resource Commission are not strangers to water by any means. Um, and we have spent the last, where's Brian up there, my co-chair? Uh, I have, uh, uh, I left the room at the wrong time at the first meeting in June, up in Mr. O'Brien's neighborhood and came back and was elected the chair of the Rules Committee. Um, and so um, we have had 16 meetings, some go to meetings, um, for just the rules committee of eight, nine of us um, since June 18th. Um, as of Monday, and Dennis Trell is on that rules committee also, and on the Natural Resource Commission, our final draft rules um, are with the uh, Leroy Seavers and Kent and Rex at the DNR, which will be sent over here shortly to the, per the Policy Research Office of the Governor. So we are now a lot closer than we were six months ago, eight months ago, nine months ago, to being able to start taking applications and do allocations on the money. My role, um, I guess I'm one of 27 administrators and 27 bankers uh, of state money on water projects, and that's what I'm going to be and I'm excited by. So I appreciate being here, even though I still believe I probably should be sitting out there. Well, the one thing I've learned as a, a new manager, I've been doing the job about 18 months, is uh, you get asked to do a lot of things that the other guys either ignore the phone calls or shake their heads. Um, and so I, I'm learning very quickly that maybe I shouldn't answer the phone, but I do appreciate to be here today. Yes, Kent, you're one of them. Just kidding. So. Um, <laughs> no, what, what I guess I want to talk about is the NRD's role in, in water sustainability over the, <coughs> over the future and the future, kind of from the past, in my perspective, coming from the outside, but having kind of been on the sidelines for a while. Um, really, the, the NRDs have been around for 42 years, 40, almost coming on 43 years now, and they're young in my mind. They're young, and as I get older, young, it takes on a different perspective to me. So yes, Lee, they are young as well, too, yep. so having been one of the founders of them. But really, pre-development, we all talk about being in the 1950s, uh, late 1950s, 60s. So the industry got ahead, and they started going and started drilling wells and irrigation technology started changing and moving forward. And so what happens in 6972, the NRDs are formed. Okay, well, but were they really focused on water management, groundwater management? Well, not so much in the first few years. <clears throat> then they realize, well, yeah, this has become. Well, you're talking 20, 25 years of industry moving ahead. And where does most regulation come from? From industry doing something that somebody doesn't like or can't control or can't get ahead of. So <clears throat> we, they had to try to somehow get control, manage, be sustainable and, and avoid conflicts with groundwater and surface water. So groundwater management plans came into place. Then comes along quality issues and we have to develop quality and put those in place as well. Um, the one thing that was lacking is we had surface water regulations and groundwater regulations that were separate. So the legislature decided that, you know what, groundwater and surface water are connected. 
And everyone in the room went, really? Wow. That's great. Now we can start managing together. But they really didn't have the tools to start going forward and managing, but we could with the, the, the strong tools, if you will. We had the, the tools of doing joint action plans and, and coming along and, and requesting the department and energies willing. <clears throat> so we, we have this new law that says, yes, they are connected. And everyone sat around going, okay, now what? And they just said, well, now we need to have another set of rules and regulations. So 962 came about, that, or excuse me, the Water Policy Task Force came about, and they sat around for two years and came up with LB 962. And then we got another set of rules and regulations that everyone said, yeah, 962. Now what? Well, integrated management plans. What are those? What do those look like? So it came another iteration of trying to develop rules and regulations. And the good thing is that they're always evolving and everyone's taking advantage of the, of the evolving technology and the evolving processes in the planning. And Jim talked about the planning that's being done in every basin. And, and we're, we're working on getting there. But it, it, it is a slow process. And to be blunt, in my opinion, it's, we're still running and we're still trying to chase things to the extent of industries ahead and, and water's ahead, but we, we're coming closer. We're getting a lot closer. The NRDs do have integrated management plans in place. Uh, we're working with moratoriums. We're working with uh, metering. We're working with allocations in places. We're working with conjunctive management. All these that when the NRDs and everyone else were put into place weren't available, but we're evolving and we're learning and we're trying to get ahead of it all eventually. And at some point, we'll catch up with it. Um, and the way I, I surmise or, or I describe this is, as I get older, my son gets older, and I used to run faster than him, but now he's starting to catch me, and I just get winded and quit eventually. So at some point, we're all going to be even, and we're hopefully going to work together to get everything moving forward. But I think that's going to be in the future. And when that occurs, I think sustainability will be something a whole lot easier to define. You're right. Sustainability has been talked about all day today, and I don't know that anybody's come up with one clean de definition, and I don't want to practice to do that either this afternoon. But sustainability is, in fact, a critical issue that has to be dealt with, depending on what we want to do. Some years ago, several years before Nebraska was talking about the integration and talking about all of the other things that have been discussed here this afternoon, our National Groundwater Association, which represents some 15,000 members of people who are in the groundwater construction industry, manufacturers and suppliers and groundwater scientists and engineers from across the United States and in some, several countries in the world, took a position with regard to sustainability. And they recognized then that there was a significant importance with regard to sustaining the quality and the quantity of groundwater supplies across the world. Uh, our, our licensed water well contractors in Nebraska are members of that National Groundwater Association and most of them aspire to that same thing. Let's keep in mind while we're talking about groundwater that when you see one of those 30-foot drill rig towers sitting up on somebody's farm, it wasn't the contractor that decided to do that, it was the landowner. And those landowners were a long ways ahead of a lot of people. Unfortunately, that has to be something that we pay attention to now. When I was in law school, we talked about which comes first, uh, the policy or the laws. And sometimes they, the policy and the practices happen long before the law does, and this is probably one of those examples. So we do have to try to catch up. That's critical. And while we're doing that, the water well industry needs to be actively involved in that process, and I think we are. Uh, we spend a lot of time now working with our contractors to make them <coughs> as good a contractor as they can be. It's critical to have a well-constructed water well. It's critical to have an adequate and appropriate pumping system to be a part of making the wisest use of that supply that's available. <coughs> And that's really critical to sustainability, is making wise conservation uses. You heard Rory Pullman talk this morning about how important it is for those kinds of practices that he is involved in every day, and the water well is a significant part of that process. So we want to make sure our contractors are prepared to do that kind of work and do it well in both constructing new wells where they're still available and in constructing replacement wells where they can do a better job than what was out there to begin with. We have one other missing link, and I think the water well profession plays a significant role in that as well. I've been in, in this water business since I got out of law school in one way, shape, or form, and one of the biggest problems we have always had, and we've had conferences after conferences here at the university and other places, in technology transfer. We don't do a good job of telling the story of the kind of things that need to be done. What we've talked about here today is part of that technology transfer, and the water well industry can and should be a part of that process frequently. The water well contractor in a local community is the only guy who talks to the landowner about this issue. 
Now, there are other people. <coughs> there are experts at the university. There are experts in extension with the university. There are experts working with natural resources districts, but very frequently, the only guy, the guy that the <coughs> landowner talks to is the well driller. He needs to get good, solid information from that water well contractor. That means that information needs to be shared with the water well contractor, and then that contractor needs to be the source of information for the landowner so that that person makes the right kind of sustainability decision when he's doing something with his water well. So the, the water well industry can and should be a part of that communication link for you. They always have been in the past, they will continue to be so. The water well industry was in fact a creature that was created by the University of Nebraska back in the 1920s when the Conservation and Survey Division's director, George Condra, actually started the first association of the water well industry. He was a man that pushed the idea of having construction standards on a voluntary basis in Nebraska. We had them for a good many years before we had mandatory standards. Now our water well contractors are licensed. They have to take an examination. They have to understand geology to pass that test. And they have to have continuing education to be maintain their professional capability. So they're out there prepared. Let's make sure we use them as a part of the sustainability story. Man, I don't want to follow that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, for, uh, first of all, I want to thank the, Dr. Ray and the university for having me here today. I, I uh, told my mom I was going to law school in Lincoln, and she said, finally, you're going to get a real job. <laughs> um, but, uh, I'm with the Nature Conservancy. I assume a lot of you know what that is, but <coughs> we're, a, we're a nonprofit conservation organization. We have a, a global footprint. And our mission has, has been biodiversity conservation, and now we've added things like, uh, you know, renewable energy and sustainable agricultural practices. And, and, and much like what you've heard all day is, you know, uh, words like sustainable and resilient and, and conservation, they're, they're what I call ecological pronouns. Uh, we all use those words as though we share meaning with them. And sometimes we can find ourselves getting into trouble and so my background and training is, is in applied social sciences and economics. And so when I came to the Nature Conservancy and they asked me to focus on the Platte River and, and things, issues with habitat and water, um, I, I try to approach it from that human and economic perspective because like what Lee just said about well, well drillers being the first point of contact, the other part of my history is I'm a river kid from Elm Creek and, and you know, after finding out many years ago that Elm Creek is where the uh, over-appropriated basin starts. I think we're going to get an archway there that says in the uh, Elm Creek, the gateway to over-appropriation. <laughs> um, uh, but, but having that history in the valley the, and, and having worked on irrigation as an electrician and those types of things, you do have to learn that, that what you measure will never be as important as who you're measuring it for with. And, and so when you become that first point of contact, whether you're a well driller or you're an NRD employee or, or a, a conservation group like ours, um, what you want to do and what you can do are never exactly in sync. You know, you, have, you might have a great grand vision, um, but you realize pretty quickly that who you're working with may not have the first clue about what you're talking about. So you have to be prepared for those baby <coughs> And, and understand that uh, people's ability to do things like water conservation or, or watershed management <coughs> is, is not this, their ability may be there, but, uh, or their desire to do it may be there, but their ability to do it may not because of fiscal constraints or social constraints or, or even regulatory issues. And so I go to a lot of meetings and I try to network with a lot of people and try to figure out how to put ideas together, how to put people together and build overlap so that, that we can, you know, not dwell in the terms and not dwell in the numbers, but try to figure out how we each start building that shared vision that Pat mentioned and, and others, you know, so that we can get synchronized and be moving together on, on issues because I think historically we've, we've kind of had a, a, a false adversarial system where we pit stakeholders, groundwater, surface water, municipal, ag, environmental. You know, we've kind of been put in a gladiator academy and asked to fight with each other for supremacy. And what we really need to do is band together and figure out how to achieve a level of diplomacy to get action uh, jointly because none of us can get there by ourselves. 
Well, um, <clears throat> to say I'm out of my element is putting it very mildly. Uh, <laughs> to start out with, I'll try not to uh, reiterate too much of what Glenn said earlier today, but uh, while I'm in the confession mode, I've even learned some new terms today like stream flow, uh, rivers, uh, <laughs> you know, th <laughs> ones of you that may have never had the privilege to come through uh, the high plains and south plains of Texas, we don't really have to deal with stream flows or rivers or trees or, or that type of thing. We're, we're on the tail end of the aquifer and um, we've We've been so fortunate with this demonstration project. Um, I've been involved with it since the planning stage in 2004. And I have the privilege of working with academia on a daily basis, but I'm not academia. I'm a farmer. I'm a rancher. Uh, I live <coughs> four blocks from where I was born. Uh, my roots are in production agriculture. And we were so fortunate that we had a State Senator Robert Duncan, who is now currently Chancellor at Texas Tech, happened in the last year. And we were fortunate in that Senator Duncan had a production agriculture background and was familiar with the region, was a graduate of Texas Tech in ag economics. So he had a lot of the same basic roots that, that I'm proud of. And he had a vision for a demonstration project, not that he didn't believe that replicated university research was not the beginning and not, the, not extremely important, but he could see issues coming down the road in the state of Texas as far as water was concerned. And he believed that we needed to have a mechanism to, number one, measure how much water producers were using. Uh, in a lot of cases, our producers didn't know how much water they were using themselves. And <clears throat> we've been fortunate, and I don't know whether Glenn mentioned it this morning or not, uh, we're funded by the Texas Water Development Board. And again, initially for eight years, we stretched that for 11. Uh, just been uh, awarded additional funding uh, through 2019. And, you know, in, in, in our region, and again, I've, I've, I've been there for 66 years, and I watched the the farm that I grew up on, uh, that my dad moved to in, in Christmas Eve 1949, that had a tremendous amount of water. We had two 8-inch wells and a 10-inch well, and that farm is currently a dry land farm. That happened in my lifetime. And Glenn showed you a map this morning just in the, the time frame of the project. In our, our phase one, we had a 24% reduction in water and storage. And so if I had to come up with a partial definition of sustainability for the southern end of the aquifer is we've got to figure out how to do more with less. And I think the approach, thanks to the producers that are involved in the project, thanks to the academia, uh, thanks to the state support, industry support. We're trying to be that mechanism to transfer information uh, and be that go between between academia and industry and, and producers. And I don't know of a grower in, that we work with, and that's all I've done my entire life, is either be involved in production agriculture or be in the ag service industry. I don't know of a grower that's not concerned about water conservation, about soil conservation, as Rory said this morning, about doing the right thing. But this is a real world. And the first thing we have to address in production agriculture is, yes, we want to do the right thing, but we've got to pay our operating loans back. If we go out of business, then the producers are not sustainable. So there's a real balance between conservation and realistic management approaches. And I, and I think with the efforts of what Nebraska is doing, what we can learn from Rory, what, what we're trying to do with our demonstration project. Um, I'm, I'm proud of the strides that we're making, the technologies that are, are coming to be. In 2005, I didn't know what a capacitance probe was. Uh, I didn't know that we could measure canopy temperature with an with a infrared thermometer. Uh, so the advent of technology is, is really kind of overwhelming some of the producers. So we see our role 
is to try to get as much of that technology in the hands of the growers, let them evaluate it, let them share their experiences with other growers, and that's how we perceive one of the best ways is to transfer that technology. So I think I, I would have to have, I'd hate to have the task to come up with a definition of sustainability <coughs> that covered every region, every crop, every circumstance in this nation. But I think, again, in our region, uh, we've got to learn how to do more with less. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. And again, I am really out of my element, but thank you. Microphones uh, here, and uh, <coughs> now the the panel is open for uh, questions from the audience. Thank you very much for uh, to all the panelists for your insightful ideas and contributions. My question is a uh, or to all of you is along the talks we have seen about water sustainability and we struggle to, as you also mentioned, to make a definition that might work along across the country and beyond and everything. I would like to ask you the question is what are your thoughts about the role of climate in shaping this concept Stay making a struggle or that is making you to have a hard time to define it or to see what is the role of climate in that. And generally speaking, let's, we could address it as climate variability, the role of extreme events such as floods or droughts, or as we can also think in terms of uh, climate change that is also uh, put some time staying in the in the definition of sustainability? Well, I'll, I'll say a few things on that. I think um, the, the way we think about it at the department is um, that, you know, there's, there's, there, there's going to be change. We know there's going to be change. So, you know, I showed you all the information that we have um, about water supplies and water uses, um, but that's, that's past information. So, you know, whether it's climate change or technological change, um, uh, there's gonna, you know, we've seen it in the past. We're gonna, we're gonna see it in the future. And so, for the for the types of information that I just showed you, it's imperative that we continue, we continue to collect that information to develop that information, because you know, I, the the size of that pie I showed you, it very well may change, and we can't count on that in, in the future. So, we've got to we've got to keep uh, keep monitoring that. Uh, I just jump in from an on, on the ground side of things. Uh, you know, my organization has taken on a lot of efforts to try to figure out how to how to deal with climate change in, in relation to biodiversity conservation. And, and often I get asked from from folks in our national organization, you know, like, you know, what are you doing in Nebraska to deal with climate change? And, and I sort of cringe in the same way that when my wife asked me if these pants make her butt look big. Um, because it's, it's a question you really don't want to have to answer because, you know, every, every time you deal with climate on the ground, you don't call it that. You know, I work with a lot of ag producers and, and they call it seasonal variability. They know that they can't guarantee rainfall. They know that, that they're going to be affected by supply based on snowpack in the mountains. Um, and they know things are changing, but, but you know, using the term specifically is, is likely to get you shut out of a conversation because of its, its volatile nature. So you kind of have to learn to, to ask the question without asking the question and figure out really where the, the pinch points are at the ground level. Um, you know, so if, if it's about you know, securing a, a stable supply of water through a growing season, not knowing what your rainfall is, then you need to figure out how to improve on-farm conservation and water management. You heard about that from Rorick and others today. And, and so, you know, implied in that is that you're trying to build resiliency to climate change, but, but you don't wear it on your forehead. 
I think one of the challenges that we have come to uh, should hopefully realize is that the media doesn't help a whole lot in some situations. And the reason I say that is because oftentimes you hear the word normal as being what to come, what we've come to expect, normal, normal precipitation, normal snowfall, normal stream flow. Well, normal is defined differently um, among this whole panel, but average is something that we need to look at. And, and if people realize what average is, it's taking the highs and lows and making it somewhere in the middle. But whoever plans for an average year, you always plan for either the best or the worst year, depending on if you're an optimist or a pessimist. So I think being adapt adaptable and understanding that we're gonna have the variation that John indicated is something that we, we need to do and be able to do as we move forward. And on a separate note, Smathers wants John to ask him the question about the pants. <laughs> I will be in your neck of the woods. <laughs> Sleep lightly, my friend. <laughs> that was too easy of an opportunity. <laughs> I concur. I have a question I'm going to uh, address to Jim in a minute, but. This is an interesting uh, session. I'm glad we've got it, and, and I'm pretty familiar with uh, several of the people up there in front. I know a little bit about what Jason has done. I don't know him well personally. I don't know Rick, but thank you for being here. But uh, Jim and Scott, Pat, Lee, John, appreciate all that you've done and the efforts that you've made when we start talking about sustainability in water in the state of Nebraska and how we get there. Now, Jim, you said that we have a bank account in the aquifer currently of two billion acre feet. Are there any records that would show what was that account 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago? Uh, there are, the, US, the USGS puts out a report um, that shows the, the water level changes in, uh, throughout the High Plains aquifer. And I think, that, I think one just came out because I think there was an editorial in the, in the World Herald. Um, I don't know the exact, volume in acre feet, but I think it was a one tenth of a one one tenth of one percent uh, uh, higher in pre-development times than it is now. So it's essentially unchanged. Um, of course, we know that that's that's uh, because we've had you know there's there's areas that have gone up and areas that have gone down. So so that's smoothed out over the entire state. But as for the state as a whole, it's basically the same. Which is good news. Uh, Jim, going back to your slide uh, with the pie charts on it, where you had the, the uh, near term versus long term, uh, I, I probably should know the answer to this question, but would you care to comment on what the department's definitions of near term versus long term are? And uh, then I would, I would also invite the rest of the panelists to, to uh, chime in on that as far as maybe what their concepts are or maybe what they should be. Sure, that's a great question. Um, there's kind of two elements to it. When we, so the definition of hydrologically connected groundwater supply um, comes from a, a, a rule, um, a definition by rule that we have, which um, is the 10% the depletion in a 50 year time period. If, if your well causes 10% or greater depletion by volume over a 50 year time period, you're, you're considered hydrologically connected. Um, but, but beyond that, um, we're, we're basically counting all the groundwater use in that area. So. Um, it, the, the time period, you know, first of all, we just, we draw that line and then the time period is basically infinite for, in terms of long term. We don't know when that full impact is going to be realized, um, but at some, someday we'll, we'll, we'll be there. I think I got a question. Um, uh, Nick Brozovic had uh, a slide in his presentation and it occurred to me that we had a pretty broad section of stakeholders represented by our panel um, and it may be a loaded question but I think it's worth uh, just discussing a little bit is do we need more national management of groundwater can I answer that <laughs> <laughs> <Please>. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> no. <laughs> no. We, we've got so much diversity in the Oklahoma, for instance, even within uh, our water district, which is the High Plains Underground Water District. <clears throat> it covers 16 counties. It's the oldest, lar largest water district in the state. There's so much difference in that aquifer just within that 16 county area. When you look at the state of Texas, we've got seven major aquifers. So if we think we have somebody or a group of people in power in Austin that could come up with a water policy that would be true, correct, and equal for the state of Texas, can't happen. I'm not saying they won't try, but I don't believe it can happen. I think that, as has been mentioned earlier today, producers want to try to do the right thing. So if you have stakeholders that are making decisions that are right for that region, I think that's the very best policy we can get. So um, my kids always say, if you want to look at the definition of redneck, my picture's right out beside it in Webster's. But, you know, I, I don't think that whether we're talking about any issue, basically, that more government is better. I, I think if we can leave it in the, in the hands of the stakeholders, we, we as producers have more at risk as far as sustainability, I think, than almost anybody. That's our livelihood. That's what we do every day. And so I think we as producers should have a role in that policy <coughs> and not somebody that's not directly involved for what that's worth. Um, I, I would I definitely agree with that, but I would just add that if they were to do something like that, the only way I can see that it would work is that they adopted a model that was similar to the model that we have here in Nebraska, um, where the state partners with the local entities and the state the state provides um, you know the the technical assistance, the funding, um, the planning assistance, and and the uh, the local NRDs. Uh, by and large, make the decisions based upon the local conditions um, that that exist in, in that area. So um, that's the only way I could see it working, and, and the reason I can say that is I see I see it working here in the state of Nebraska. I'm I'm pretty fond of saying to people that, that uh, governance comes from you and government happens to you, um, and if you don't do the former, you're going to get the latter, and and so. Uh, last night I was out to supper with a couple of close friends of mine and, and Scott Smathers uh, <laughs> and, and we were talking about being a different stakeholder for water in, in Nebraska and, and what it is is the water's the same it's it's H2O um, but how we how we perceive our need of it and use of it is different and so it would be like if all four of us had different denominations of money in our pocket we know we have value, but we don't know how to exchange value between each other, and we don't know who has the greater value. And so I think if, if we're going to stay on top of groundwater management and surface water management and, and all the uses implied by both, then we have to sort of figure out what our rate of exchange is and, and, and how big is our bank. And, and that's really, to echo what Jim's saying, is, is we're having that technical support and, and that arbiter of information is, is critical to help bring you together for those fair exchanges. One of the principal reasons why NRDs were created was because of the diversity of geography, geology, water, climate, and everything else in Nebraska. And we had a lot of extremes here from one end of the state to the other, and the only way you could truly govern that process is to have some of that control fairly close to home. But the critical point is that everybody in the process who has an interest in that supply has to have a piece of that process. Uh, people have to learn to play together, and sometimes we don't do that very well yet. So I think we've got a lot of lessons to learn in that regard, but there's no doubt in my mind that the creature natural resources districts give Nebraska a definite leg up in getting that job done properly uh, when, when it's time to get it done. We'll get there. I think any time you talk about federal involvement, it's a cookie cutter mentality. In this state, it's not a cookie cutter mentality. As you heard, the diversity, here are our friends in Texas, uh, family in California, Nevada. The states know what they need. The states know how to manage. Um, and if they don't, um, you'll see results of that. I, I think we're very proactive here in the state. I think we have been for many years, and now we're finally starting to put some of those pieces together 
uh, through everybody at this table uh, and many more. So I, I think that the local control uh, is always the, the best opportunity for us to succeed, always. Working for a locally elected board, if I was to answer any way other than no, <laughs> I would be known as the former general manager of the Upper Niagara White Natural Resources District. However, I would comment it by saying that regulations are expensive. They're expensive to enforce, they're expensive to implement, they're expensive all around. Uh, meters, installing meters, having people read meters is, is a type of regulation that's expensive. So anytime you try to add more governance on, you add more expense. And then that gets back to the local taxpayers and how we are responsible to them and what we're actually doing with that tax money to regulate for what. So that's always a consideration in my mind when I, when I hear about more government. Figure out how to work this thing. Uh, thanks, Pat, for segueing into my question. Uh, we've all talked a lot about how much groundwater is there, what are surface flows, what are the interactions. <coughs> I have a question about the tools that are used to measure those. Uh, when I worked briefly for the Department of Natural Resources, the funding for uh, gauging stations was being decreased. What do you folks need in the future as far as the tools to do your jobs? Well, I can speak on behalf of the department. We have, we've been blessed with um, a number of additional staff over the last 10 years to, to deal with integrated water management, as well as money to uh, uh, conduct uh, a, lot of, a lot of studies that actually produce the, the data that you've seen there. Um, what we've really done is use the data we have and develop the data we don't. Um, our, our stream gauging program today is very robust. We, we operate about half of the gauges in the state and um, all, most of the canal gauges in the state, and so that's about 100 stream gauges and I think at least 100 canal <coughs> gauges. Um, obviously, the, the natural resource districts do a lot of really great work measuring groundwater levels, so we have a really robust data set there. The, the, main, the main hurdle that we had at, um, in terms of understanding the water supply was in the use, especially the groundwater use. And, you know, when you need to build things like groundwater models where you need to break that down on a, like a one mile grid, um, you, that's, that's a pretty, pretty uh, daunting task. But we've used a lot of remote sensing data um, and we've, we have, we've, we've essentially developed groundwater use data um, from 1950 through 2010 based on um, based on the climate data that we have available to us and that remote sensing data so that's allowed us to actually construct and, and run those models calibrate them and and get some answers out of them so you know i think i think the wave of the future certainly is remote sensing and we'll, we'll continue to invest more heavily in that um, one thing that we used to do at the department a lot we did a we had we had a survey crew and they did a lot of ground-based surveying um, another great example of remote sense data where now you can buy LIDAR at a relatively inexpensive uh, cost. We have it for a large, large portion of the state. And so, you know, that, that's uh, something our floodplain management se section uses in our dam safety section to, to help look at, at floodplains and dams. So um, that's really going to be the wave of the future, I think, is the, the remote sensing. Well, I think a drone would be really cool. <laughs> I'm, probably I'm not going to get one. But the, the one thing that we've been doing a lot of it is collecting data, trying to analyze data, doing models. So the one resource that I think we need, and I'm going to be very blunt about this, is time. We need time to see how things are going to work, time to see how things are going to change. We can implement stuff, but <coughs> society today is an instant society. They want instant changes. How many people get upset when they see that little blue line going across the internet? and they want that page downloaded right now. Well, it just doesn't happen. Things take time to see how they work and, and, and if the processes can come across as we think they can come across and as implemented. Uh, Lyndon talked today about their recharge projects and, and it was, it was, the question was asked, you know, how quickly is that going to get back to the river? Well, we, we think we know what it's going to do, but give us the time to figure out if it's actually going to do it and we're going to work. And I know that's not how I'm sorry, Senator Carlson, legislatures want it. They want to see how their money is being spent and see, be, being spent wisely, but it just doesn't work that way. You still have a blue line and shatter? Yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, I'd add to what Pat said is, is that um, 
you know, if you were going to, if you're thinking about a microwave oven, you assume that somebody with a knowledge of high energy physics was involved in the <coughs> construction of that, but you don't want a high energy physicist hanging out in your kitchen every time you want to cook a burrito. Um, and so they figured out how to make it safe and marketable. And when I think, I, you know, I'm always impressed when I come down to Lincoln and, and to these points because I learn about new interesting uh, research going on and, and tools and technology. And then I kind of sadly weep all the way home because I'm like, how am I going to put that on the ground? Because it, it, it doesn't have that off the shelf uh, characteristic yet. And so, you know, when you ask what tools we need, I think we have a lot of really great tools. It's figuring out how to make those tools more off the shelf and ready to use for the average uh, producer, consumer, or water stakeholder because they don't have the years of, of trial and error that you do uh, from the research and, and they don't have the patience to learn it so they really do need that blue bar to move a little bit faster so that they're not standing there all day waiting to find out something that they kind of already knew. From a program perspective, probably the number one thing is real-time stream gauging data. Um, you know, we on a daily basis are looking at what are stream flow, you know, what's stream flow doing in Wyoming, what's it doing on South Platte and Denver, and then what does that mean for us? Um, you know, all these folks today were talking about managing these different projects based on target flows. Well, you know, as of you know, last year, we were worried that the real-time gauging station at Overton, Nebraska was going to go away. And that's a huge deal because that's you know how people are making their decisions on a daily basis. So maintaining long-term stream gauging records is very important to us. Well, I can tell you we wouldn't let that happen. <coughs> um, we, would, we would have definitely take, yeah. taken that one over. And I'll just put a quick plug in for our art. We, we did just, uh, Jason, I think is very thankful we finally did launch a real-time stream gauging yes. website um, so that he can get into our data as well. So if, if you're... That you can find that on our, on our homepage. There's a link to our, our real-time stream gauging data. And I'd also say, if 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 you have opinions on where stream gauges are lacking, um, we we'd like to talk to you because we always have the potential to add to that network as well. I have one more, maybe less loaded question. Um, it occurred to me as you're talking about sustainability that it, it, it is true that we each have a different definition of sustainability. But I also think that we have uh, trouble with the, with the definition of water use. So I'd be really interested on how each of you uh, defines water use. Uh, because we, just, we talk about it in terms of moving water from one place to the other. Is that really water use? For us, it's strictly consumptive use, so it's, it's, it's water that we lose from the state to the atmosphere that um, then probably generates rain in Iowa. Um, so that's, that's, we're strictly on consumptive use. From a program perspective, I think government committee members can correct me, but you know, we, we have a bucket of water and we can use that water one time to try to provide one benefit or maybe a suite of benefits. But when we want to provide some ecosystem service, scour vegetation, transport sediment, we get one shot, we, you know, you, you, you turn the spigot and the water goes and either you did or did not achieve what you had hoped to as far as your management objectives. So it's not, not necessarily tied to consumption, it's more for ecosystem services. It's you, no. <laughs> Working for a locally elected board. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, I, I think we have a, our, our statutory challenges to look at what all the beneficial uses are and what all the needs are to try to balance all those needs are and try to meet the needs where possible, be it agriculture, commercial, domestic, recreation, etc. So the uses are out there and, and we're charged with trying to make sure that each one gets their piece of the pie. From my perspective, in working with the task force and with the Natural Resource Commission, being an outdoor individual and sportsman and a conservationist, um, we have to have realistic views of our needs and our use when you talk about those terms. Um, there's members of John and I's group uh, that uh, 
uh, want the largest pail of water when, quite frankly, they deserve maybe a quarter of the pail of water, if you will, or vice versa. I think educated sense of one feeds the other. What is actual use? What is the use going to drive to a production value? You can decide whatever production means to you. But and then there's 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 waste, and blatant waste. And you don't have to live inside of a city the size of Lincoln or Omaha very long to see rampant waste on a regular basis. Um, and quite frankly, I think that education value is very weak at this point. Um, if you don't believe me, drive around this town sometime at 6.30 in the morning after a three inch rain. So, I mean, there's a difference there. And I think from a standpoint of everybody on this panel, we all have a different view, but I still think at the end of the day, the stakeholder's value is the use of that water produces what? I might expand on what Jason said too. Of course, and you noticed I, I did have in-stream use on my pie chart. Um, and that we also do look at that as a use, but not, um, but it's not a use that removes the water from availability. So we have we have water in our streams that's often used m multiple times um, before it flows out of the streams. The, the example would be the Loop um, hydropower plant that then um, that water is then used in stream for the in stream flows in the, the Lower Platte River. Your turn. Okay, my turn. Uh, frequently, <coughs> we have a tendency, I think, to to confuse diversions with uses. Uh, everything that's diverted isn't used. As a matter of fact, the North Platte River system probably wouldn't run efficiently as an integrated management system if every drop that was diverted to begin with was used and not returned to the river. There are a lot of opportunities on the river systems where water gets a chance to be used several times over before it leaves the state. And I think we need to keep that in mind and not measure um, the totals that are consumed, if you will, are utilized by diversion numbers rather than the actual use numbers. I, I, I just add to that by saying I think, you know, use is an anthropogenic term, you know, we, thereby subjective. We all have our uses of water, but it's the same water and, and it does get used multiple times and, and so where we fall short is because we, we don't have the means to get to water in, in a timely fashion or in a, in a feasible economically fashion and that creates the conflict. So I, I think we as stakeholders and, and quote unquote users of water, um, we find ourselves defending turf because of that subjective understanding. and, and and so, I, and I think we're doing better than we ever have in Nebraska. You know, I've been at this with the Nature Conservancy for 15 years, and, and we're not talking about it the same way we did back in the late 90s, early 2000s. We're starting to learn from what worked and what didn't work. We're starting to adopt new technology and, and better science, and, and so the conversation is changing. And so, you know, to say that there is uh, a legitimate use one over the other, I think, leads us down a, a blind alley at times. Well, I probably said too much last time, but, uh, you know, when we, we look at what we're doing as far as uh, water use, um, about 95% of the water we extract from the aquifer in the southern area is used for agriculture production. So what we're trying to do is, is maximize yield per increment of water not necessarily maximize total yield uh, because <clears throat> what we believe is that uh, maximum yield does not equate to maximum net return and there's some point of dimension returns before we get there so one of the things that we try to provide back to <clears throat> our stakeholders is you know what's uh, what yield are we getting per increment of water that we apply through irrigation or rainfall in a combination of both. And, and we, it was a hard lesson to learn, but in 2011, when we had already invested a tremendous amount of water in a crop, but because of, of the drought, we had to abandon those crops. So basically that water in essence was wasted because we didn't get, the producer didn't get any return for that investment and, and that water was gone forever. So, um, you know, we look at it as, as a, um, a yield or an economic return per increment. So, so I 
would like to take this opportunity to thank the panel for <coughs> taking the time and uh, <coughs>